Welcome to the Jerry Bovino Show. And now, here's Jerry. Jerry Bovino, we're back with Bull Market Mortality. Scott Quartz, you can't miss him. Great guy. Scott and I over the years have talked, oh, for years and years about doing a show together. We always hang out with the locals over at Jour de Fete with Olivier there. And uh, he's kind enough to come in. Scott's an expert investment advisor. He's going to tell us some of his background, and then we're going to get into investments. Scott's very worried about the equity markets right now, and he's going to tell us why. So, Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jerry. Great to see you, Dr. Bovina. There you go. I, <laughs> <laughs> I actually am a doctor. I don't just play one on TV, but thank you. So, Scott, you, you were originally from Minnesota, and the first thing that it's impossible to do any kind of journalistic discussion, starting with you, without talking about your height, because it's the first thing that people see. So talk about what it's like to be almost seven feet tall. Give us a little background on that. Well, for any metaphysical people, it's a strange, art, it's a strange incarnation to be seven feet tall. And uh, of course, my destiny was sealed at a very young age since I was six foot eight in, uh, in eighth grade. So uh, <laughs> I'll never forget, I was listening to Hawaii Five-0. I just finished the football season in sixth grade. And I get a call. And it was a would-be coach. And he said, have you ever played basketball? And I said, no. And he said, do you want to play? So I yelled downstairs and I said, dad, can I play basketball? And he goes, sure. <laughs> but you had a grandfather that was 6'11", huh? I did. And why do you, is, is your mom tall too? Or? My mother uh, was 5'10", and my dad was 6'3", so I think it was gene skipping or something. Yeah, but so when you're that tall, first of all, it's physically imposing to the rest of us who were of sort of a more of a bell-shaped curve normal height. You're obviously on the far end of it. What do people say to you when they come up? Do they say, how tall are you, or do you play basketball? What's the first thing that they... Well, I think there's something disarming about me, personally. It's nice whether I'm in Los Angeles or New York City or wherever I'm at, I always have friends. People always ask me, who do you play for? Do you play for the, the Knicks? Do you play for the Lakers? Did you do this? Did you do that? So it's a great conversation piece, and it opens you know, a lot of doors. Uh, I haven't had anybody that's really intimidated by it. Yeah, but I'm sure the bullies never kicked sand on your face in the beach. <laughs> I, I haven't had many natural predators. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're at the top of the food chain, should we say? I'm peaceful. I'm, you know. Peaceful, I like that. So... Would you change that, by the way? Would you want to be just like 6'2 or something? Or do you like having a conversation piece to start? I always wonder about that. Well, it's tough being this tall when you're young. But when it's all over, I'm going to look back and say, gosh, I hate to, I hate to give that up. It's been a great run. Yeah. And I love my height, and it's been a it's tremendous advantage. You know. It certainly differentiates you from the rest of the crowd. So you grew up in Minnesota. I, I was born in Minnesota. Okay. And uh, grew up in Denver, actually. And uh, How did your family get to Denver? What was the backstory? My father that? came out hunting out here and uh, fell in love with the panorama. It's a beautiful place. Can you imagine Denver had maybe 200,000 people in 1963? I have a few friends who hunt at the Caribou Club on Friday nights. <laughs> 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 Looking for two... <laughs> Two-legged game, but... I was a charter member, but I no longer belong, so... <laughs> <laughs> so your dad came out here, and he liked Colorado for hunting, and stayed. Well, you compare the weather here to Minnesota. We have champagne powder, and that's Arctic fronts, you know. Right. Uh, he loved the weather. He loved everything about Colorado. It was the West. Yeah, and I know. I love everything about Colorado, too. You know, I always joke with people, in John Denver's famous song, Rocky Mountain High, where he says... He was born in the summer of his 27th year, right. coming home to a place he'd never been before. That's how I was. Uh, when I got here the first time, and I think I was about 26 or 27, I got off the plane and I said, oh, this is my place. Wow. It's a, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's so heaven. you grew up and you played high school basketball in Denver. Arvada. Arvada. I grew up in West Arvada yeah, near Boulder. So. What was that experience like? Well, you know, it's great growing up in the Rockies. I was always athletic, clean air. It was safe. You know, it was Americana, right? Yeah. 
and uh, being that close to the mountains. And of course, uh, Aspen, you know, was, was mystical in those days. You'd see people come down from Aspen and they were different. They were better looking, their hair was great, you know, they were successful. <laughs> and the Aspen dream started at a very early age on the Front Range. So when you were playing high school basketball, you were, uh, were you a naturally gifted athlete or did you have to train yourself to be good or? Well, what did Einstein say? It's 90% you know, hard work, one, 99% hard work, 1% inspiration. So, yeah. you know, I don't, I, I was an All-American three times in high school and I worked extremely, extremely hard. I was disciplined and I knew exactly what I wanted and, you know, had a dream. Did you have good coaching? I had the best coaching in high yeah. school. I mean, yeah. I had a coach who basically adopted me in junior high and uh, it, 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 I improved every, every day with him at Arvada West High School, a guy named Joe Beckner. If, People often use the metaphor, Scott, that sports is sort of uh, comparable to real life, that, that the things we do, our friend Greg Lewis would, would understand this, that, and we always, you know, journalists compare the struggles in sports to the struggles in real life. Do you think that sports prepared you for real life in any tangible way? It was an amazing experience. Sports is a compressed life, if you will. You can live your life, or, or a facsimile of your life, in four quarters, you know. And you learn to overcome adversity. You learn to, to, uh, to recover when you're behind. You learn not to get ar arrogant when you're on top. And you learn about the cycle, you know, the samsara, as they call it, the ups and the downs, and how to deal with them. And, yeah, and that's the, the, one of the most important things to learn in sports is how to lose and come back. And, you know, I think it was Vince Lombardi who said, show me a guy who's a good loser and I'll show you a loser. Right. But, you you know, like in tennis, which my kids play tennis, 10 million people play tennis every day, 5 million lose. Right. Okay, you've got to learn how to just bounce back. They say Roger Federer is the best player at, like, having a loss and five minutes later, he's ready to play the next match. Right. Yeah, yeah, you've got to overcome the negative aspects of your life if it's losing or whatever it is. And uh, you have to stay focused on what you want and improve every day to get there, no matter what you're doing, right? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to hear the story about how Scott went to the national championship game, won, and then we're going to talk a little bit about investments because Scott's an expert on uh, investing and he's concerned right now with good reason. A lot of people are in his court, should we say. Um, but first, let's take a very short break to recognize the underwriters who generously support us here at Grassroots Television. Picking County Dry Goods, David Fleischer, Bishop Plumbing, Heating and Air Conditioning, and Andrew Sandler at Bootsy Bellows. Bootsy's going to have a great season coming up this winter. So we're going to thank our underwriters. When we come back, we're going to hear the story about the national championship at Kentucky, and then we're going to tell you how not to lose your money. We're coming right back. Bishop Plumbing and Air Conditioning, serving Aspen and Vail for over 40 years. Shoe covers, name tags, IDs. Let Bishop worry about your heating, plumbing, and air conditioning issues so that you don't have to. Bishop Plumbing and Air Conditioning, 925-8610. Pitkin County Dry Goods opened its doors on July 4, 1969 as Aspen's source for 60s mod fashion. Joining the sophisticated with the informal, Pitkin County Dry Goods offers an eclectic mix of creative boutique designers and wearable fashion basics. Aspen's oldest clothing retailer, Pitkin County Dry Goods, continues to deliver renowned customer service and innovative style to a loyal local and international clientele. Pitkin County Dry Goods. You can reach them at 520 East Cooper Ave or give them a call at 970-925-1681.
Jerry Bovino, we're back with Scott Quartz. Quartz, basketball Quartz, Scott Quartz. Is that really your name or you it, made it, it up? It was. It was really uh, it was great to have the last name that fit in so well with my career. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Scott's an expert on investing. He's going to tell us about uh, his concern about the bull market, which is the longest in history. In history now. And it's As a, of it, Tuesday. Yeah. The S&P hit all-time record highs and... But let's just finish up talking about your sports career. So you're in Denver in high school. Um, you had a huge game against Cherry Creek that sort of catapulted you into the national spotlight. Talk about that. Well, it's interesting. It all came down in high school. I mean, I was being recruited by 7,000 schools. It was overwhelming. 7,000? Yeah, I mean, when you're that. Are there 7,000 schools? It was just incredible. I mean, I had to have protection. I had guys in suits following me around in school. and. And, uh, you know, it was an amazing experience. I had nothing else to compare it to. So youth is wasted on youth, right? If you don't... If you didn't know <laughs> how great... I thought everybody went through that, you know. <laughs> I knew better. But the NCAA has very strict regulations about recruiting. But did you find that some people were trying to skirt that? I mean, nowadays they seem to do it all the time because there's just so much money involved in college sports. And... Talk about that phenomenon. Well, there were always, you know, in life there's always incentives. Like we were talking about the, the uh, metaphor for life. But, uh, you know, I had an ethical coach and my father was ethical and we decided not to cut corners. And, uh, you know, I was recruited by the top five schools in the country. Did they have to go through your coach? How do they contact you? What's the regular? Well, How does it work? We, most of us don't know. Uh, you know, it, uh, the big day for me was in that game in Cherry Creek when I played against a guy named Brian Johnson. We were the two biggest recruits in Colorado and the country. Uh, we were both top 10 athletes in the country. And I dropped 29 points that night and 18 rebounds. And I always loved to stay around when I had great games. You know, the crowd went empty. I could still smell the popcorn and the body heat. The doors were closed, and I'm alone in this gym after all that adrenaline. So I always stayed around and worked on my game. I looked at what I made mistakes. Even though I had a perfect game, I knew I could have improved in certain areas. So I'm in there shooting, and all of a sudden I hear this on the metal door outside, and I open it, and there's Lute Olson and, and Dean Smith and Coach Joe Hall and the greatest coaches in the country, and they come in, and they did a combine with me. But they actually came personally t to Denver to, in to interview you. The bleachers were full of the top coaches in the country that night. I think there were 50 top coaches that night watching that game. And uh, we went through the combine. They tested my skills, and they all joked, and they all said, he's mine, he's mine, he's mine, he's How mine. How do they test your skills? What do they actually do? They wanted to see how my left hand was, how my jump shot was. Uh, could you go to your left? Oh, yeah. I, see, Bill, that's a big, big plus. I owe, I owe Bill Bradley, Senator Bill Bradley, Rhodes Scholar Bill Bradley, uh, a great honor for that. We'll talk about that when you're, when you're ready. But uh, uh, they all were saying, he's mine, he's mine, he's mine. And literally, how efficient is the market two days later? I was ranked top 10 in the country. Because of that, those visits? Yeah, great attitude. You know, it had all the, the monikers. And uh, that, was, that, was my, that was my junior year. So, OK, so that was your junior year, yeah. and they were already coming around. Well, they were there in junior high. I mean, it was crazy. I, I had these guys in suits that would approach me at football games and, and uh, I was, when I was watching and say, hey, you know, we're from the Colorado School of Mines. And, How's your science? <laughs> <laughs> but did you actually go visit? How many colleges did you visit? We were allowed to visit seven. And uh, I went to uh, USC. And uh, funny story about that. Uh, well, I, what's the story about USC? Well, you know, I grew up in an insular world, of course, with sports like that. And I'd never seen anything like USC. And I get there, and my god, you know, it's just this urban football splendor. Uh, I went to a party that night, and everybody's getting high. I didn't, but everybody got high. And beautiful girls, and it's like a scene like I'd never seen in my life. And even some of the athletes were smoking weed that night. So I went to the coach the next day. I won't mention his name. Uh, and, and I said, Coach, we've got a problem. Your players are, like, smoking weed and partying. And he said, well, what time were you in last night? And, and I said, well, before midnight. And he goes, sleep. That's all that counts. <laughs> so, of course, he was fired the next year. I, I checked that off my list. But I visited Wake Forest. There was a coach named Lute Olson, one of the great coaches in the country yeah. at Iowa. I visited Kentucky. I visited UCLA and uh, decided to go to Kentucky. Kentucky was always a 
The Adolf, Adolf Rupp, right? The legendary Adolf Rupp who died while I was there. And my coach was his assistant coach and his successor, which were very difficult shoes to, to fill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so you chose to go to Kentucky. And in your freshman year, did you get to play? I did. Yeah? Yeah, I did. We, That's uh, unusual for a freshman to get to play. Well, it was a, it was a great team. We all worked hard, and, uh, you know, we all had talent. So, you know, there was a great opportunity. It was a special team because that's the team that the legendary coach, John Wooden, had beaten the year before to win his number John 11. John at UCLA. At UCLA, his number yeah. 11 Final Four championship. And in talking with his people, he retired that year, so con UCLA was out of the question for me. But they all suggested that I consider Kentucky because they had seven guys coming back. And that was like the spotlight on, I mean, unbelievable. Kentucky basketball is a big deal. Right. Well, I didn't realize how big the tradition was, if you can imagine. I mean, you know, it, it's, it was the place to go. And I, I just chose it because I liked the people and I liked the, the program, you know. And you won the national championship your first year. We won it. We beat uh, Magic Johnson on the way to the finals. He would come back and win it the next year. Uh, we went 32. He was at Michigan State. Michigan I State. That. Yep. Yep. And uh, yeah, we went all the way. It was, you know, the most incredible experience. Uh, Did you get a ring? Life. Did you get a ring? I have a championship ring and a watch. But you don't wear it, though. I, I noticed that if I had a championship ring, I'd probably <sighs> I like have it in my nose. I should know? have brought it. I keep it in a safety <laughs> deposit box. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is my son-in-law Dalton is a big uh, Longhorns fan, oh. uh, Texas Longhorns, and he loves their football. And one time I wanted to get him a cool uh, birthday present. So I went online and I found from the 2005 year when Vince Young won the national championship. Sure, sure. I remember, one of the players was selling his ring. It was, re it was really sad. He needed money. Yeah. You know? And so I bought it for my son-in-law. But And he wears it and then with his friends at the games, you know, when they're... But I said, how sad. He didn't know. No one told him that if he just wore that ring at any car dealer in Texas, he'd never worry about making a living. You no know? kidding. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. We, we've had that with our teammates, too, and we try to, when they, you know, if they have financial problems, we're trying to help them out. I get calls often from teammates. Yeah. Unfortunately, most athletes aren't preparing as much as they should for their future. And well, that's, so that's our perfect segue to go into investing because athletes make phenomenal sums of money, but they're ill-prepared to know what to do with it. And so many storied athletes, whether they're boxers, basketball players, Allen Iverson, $140 million. He's broke. Right. I mean, totally broke. And then just shouldn't the colleges give these guys some kind of preparatory course on basic investing 101? Well, can you imagine the dilemma of maybe coming from an impoverished neighborhood, you know, the hood? never having any money and no one in your family ever having money and suddenly you get a twenty million dollar bonus yeah and you know most of us know how quickly money goes right there's nothing more fluid there's unlimited goods and services <laughs> it's like i it's <laughs> like i tell my kids the world is designed to take your money <laughs> absolutely absolutely we have great salesmen in high heels uh <laughs> divorces marriages uh, clothing companies, we advise some NBA players, and uh, we have a rule. They have to do exactly what we say, and that's a difficult <laughs> discipline to impose. That's a good rule, though. I saw this little YouTube video of Shaq, and he was talking about when he got his first $30 million contract, which is almost 30 years ago. Right. And he, uh, he said, well, 50 guys and financial advisors came in and said, Shaq, you give me a thirty million in two years, I'll have two hundred million. And he said, you know, that just didn't sound right to me. So then I got this little short Jewish guy who came in and said, Shaq, you're going to make enough money. We're going to put you in some treasury bonds, diversified portfolio. I'm going to start some, a, a, a charity so you can employ your family to do good deeds. He said, I like that guy. Yeah. And Shaq is a very wealthy guy right now. He's a wealthy guy. He's a smart guy, and he understood that with that kind of cash flow. All he has to do is maintain his principal and stay ahead of inflation initially, and he did that. And, of course, he's got an afterlife now with uh, advertising and promotion. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, so start out now. You are an investment advisor. Which company do you work with? Uh, MTB Financial in Denver. I live up here part-time, full-time and part-time, depending on the weather and the snow. Let's pray for snow this winter, huh? But yeah. uh, MTB Financial in Denver, and uh, we're a conservative investment firm. 
and uh, we clear through one of the largest uh, financial services companies in the world, Hilltop, and uh, Hilltop Securities in Texas. And uh, you know, that's the story here in the world record bull market that we're in right now. Uh, 3,453 days on this bull market, and we're nearing an economic expansion that's going to be a record, too. So we're, we're basically, you know, it's interesting because I know you're concerned. You're not alone about what's going to happen to the financial markets. Um, but Yogi Berra said that yeah. it's always difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Right. So give us some of the warning signs that sophisticated investors like yourself are starting to see little red flashing lights that say that the strongest oak tree in the world doesn't grow to the sky. Well, you know, we, it, it's, they call it, economics is a dismal science because the predictive ability can be somewhat dismal. You're, you're, you're never absolutely accurate, or when you are, you're, you're lucky. But right now, this bull market has run an amazing 3,453 days. That's up well over 300%. Uh, this is a world since 1956 when bull markets have run 1,800 days instead of 3,400 plus. So we're twice the last big one. Twice that now. And we have some sophisticated technical uh, indicators that we look at. One's called the yield curve. It's simple. If you invest money at two years, you get a certain rate. If you invest money at 10 years, you get a certain rate. If you invest money at 30 years, you get a higher rate. Well, that curve, those rates are flattening out and even inverting. We think they're going to invert, which means you're going to get less at 30 years than you do at 10. That means investor confidence is lagging, especially institutional conf confidence. And uh, so that's one indicator we're looking at. So an inverted yield curve uh, is, is like a, a really bad alarm going off. It's a canary in the coal mine Thank to you. be careful. Yes, canary in the coal mine. And what, what, how has that been an indicator? Well, it's been accurate, again, since 1956, uh, approximately eight months after uh, a yield curve inverts, then uh, it's typically eight months till we have a recession. There's one exception, and that's in 06 and 07 when it was 21 months. But it's going to happen sooner or later. The thing about bears, and there are people who are perma bears, you know, there's always the sky is falling, chicken little running around, that's going to be the end. Eventually, you're going to be right. But the, the thing that I've learned over my lifetime is that bubbles, which we're in a bubble, right. bubbles grow bigger before they burst. They do. I mean, so you don't know when it's going to end. You just want to be prepared like musical chairs when, when the music stops that you're not sitting there without a chair. Well, you're exactly right. We think we're in the ninth inning. We have many other indicators we'll discuss today. We think we're in the ninth inning. We think the party's just about over, but the party's been juiced, if you will. It's like bringing, just when the party's over, somebody brings a keg. Right. And that's, <laughs> that's a great, that's a great way of looking. <laughs> Let's stay a little The longer. juice just arrived, and uh, that's going to extend this, this run a little bit. But if you look right now to all the defensive and the most conservative and safe stocks in the world, utility stocks and the big major blue chips, they only comprise about 10% of every portfolio in America today. In other words, defense is out of the house. Most people are speculating. They're looking to get in the FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon. Uh, what are the rest of them? Uh, Google. Google. Yeah. and Momentum-driven stocks. Right. They want growth. The market's craving growth. They want that Bentley out there. Yeah. And that, you know. So, uh, you know, we're concerned about that. Last week, silently, we reached $13.3 trillion in consumer debt. It's the biggest number since 07 before the financial crisis. Consumer debt, that's not, that's not our national debt. Just consumers on their credit cards or whatever owe $13 trillion. $13 trillion. And, and part, that, that includes you know, consumer debt. That includes student loans, by the way, which have a default rate right now of about 10%. So we're starting to see that increase a little bit. Look, this isn't, ap isn't an apocalyptic forecast. It's a natural cycle. Mm -hmm. And bull markets, correct, they're epidemiological. They are made up of human emotion and human beings. Like anything else epidemiological, as they get older, they're more and more susceptible to uh, illness, vulnerability. Well, that's a good way to talk. But talk about fear and greed that drive the markets, because 
It's like we're all greedy and you want to get your stock to go up. On the other hand, you don't want to lose money. How important are those emotions in driving investor sentiment? Well, if you could lay a, fo a football gridiron on like a tray and you had a handle and there's fear at this end and there's greed at this end, the market, and you could fill it with water, a limited amount because there's a limited amount of capital, it's always moving from greed to fear and greed to fear and greed to fear. Well, as we speak, even though we're in the ninth inning, and this is typical of bull markets when they're, when they're coming to an end, uh, the small investors are starting to come in. I noticed JP Morgan is giving free trades today, uh, 100 free I trades. I saw that on CNBC yesterday morning where they had an ad that said, you know, free trades, the first 100 trades are free. We call them odd lotters in the olden days. I've been in the business for 36 years. Uh, they buy, they're small investors and they always come in at the top. And it's really cruel because these big institutions even promote it. And uh, that's another indicator we're looking at right now is a small investor rush to the top. So it wouldn't be good financial advice. Sometimes you'll hear people say, sell everything. Get me in, you know, gold or whatever, Bitcoin. Uh, you wouldn't advise your clients to sell everything. No, you know, there's a certain strategy you execute at this point in the market. Uh, we have to remember that in 08, during the financial crisis, the S&P 500, which is an index or measure of, of stocks, was down 57%. And the only people who really lost out in 2008 were the people who sold in the trough, people who had low quality investments and sold because the market was back to normal by 2013 and of course the rest is history today. Yeah. So the idea is you, you start looking at resilient, high quality, enduring, competitive investments, whether you're a private investor, real estate investor, or a stock and bond investor. The, the, the key word is quality. Strong balance sheets, lots of cash, Try and find companies that are selling below their asset value, below, below book value. Classic Graham and Dodd stuff. That's like Warren Buffett's Classic, stuff. yeah. So what companies, give us an example of a company like that, that and it will do well in, in general, on bull markets and bear markets, what companies like have real earnings that can be sustained? Well, you look at the, uh, we call them the ambassadors. There's, there are quite a few, 53 companies right now, uh, that have increased their earnings for over 25, 25 or over 25 years. Amazing, amazing balance sheets. And again, the, these are companies that have enduring, enduring competitive advantages. And, uh, you know, companies like Exxon or Procter & Gamble. And they're out of favor right now. They are out of favor. I own Procter <laughs> Gamble. It's done nothing. You have you know, to. But I'm that kind of investor. I like predictable stocks that go down every year. <laughs> <laughs> well, the case of Procter & Gamble or companies like the ambassadors that we're discussing is you've gotten great dividends while you wait. Dividends that were greater than anything you could get in the bond market or CDs at banks. They've been paying 25 to 4%. Well, our payday is coming. Uh, Gretzky if I could use a sports analogy, was a great hockey player because he always knew where the puck was going to be. Yes, instead he skated of being to where it was going to be, not where it was. In the crowd, yeah, where the, the lower paid guys were. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what we have to be in this market cycle. We have to shorten our bond yields high, by high quality bonds. So do you think interest rates, you talked a little bit about uh, in our email exchange before the show, you talked a little bit about how the Fed kills bull markets, yes. the Federal Reserve, interest rates. Explain to our viewers, Scott, how important are interest rates in sustaining a bull market? Well, that's, and that's a great question. Every great bull market is always preceded by what we call a moderation. Scientists would call it a Goldilocks period, and that's where all the conditions are just perfect to promote that bull market. For example, up until the springtime, we had suppressed inflation, less than 1%. De minimis. We had low interest rates, almost 0%, and we had lots of capital pouring into the markets. And that creates a very, very low volatility market that brings in speculators and more speculators. Well, in the spring, that all ended, and suddenly we're now at 2% inflation. We think inflation is going to go to 2.5%. 2.5% is a problematic number because the Fed has to start raising rates quicker to stave that off and maintain price stability. Uh, we suddenly have interest rates that are rising. Uh, we think we're going to have two or three more interest rate increases on the part of the Fed. We have an unprecedented example of a president asking the Fed director, Jay Powell, not to raise rates anymore. 
Why? Because the Federal Reserve murders bull markets. And he knows that. I mean, basically, uh, stocks give you some discounted present value of their earnings stream. And as interest rates go up, the value goes down of those earnings. And that's the problem that President Trump sees coming, is as soon as we jack up the interest rates, it's going to slow everything down. We but we need, here's the interesting thing, and even I don't know why, and I haven't heard anybody, we should have like inflation up the wazoo right now. Right. Everything I buy seems to be cost more. My electric, my, it's like nothing's cheaper. Right. And yet, they always say inflation, oh, it's 1%. It's like, why don't we have inflation? Well, we do. It's, it's creeping inflation. Inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods. There's a lot of dry powder on the sidelines. We're seeing a 3.5% inflation rate in oil, in, in petroleum. We see that when we fill our tanks. And the real rate of inflation right now is about 2.3%. Now look, basic economics says you can't have full employment without some reasonable rate of inflation. But again, once we reach 2.5%, that's when the Fed begins to murder the bull market because they have to raise rates in order to keep the price stability so we're not paying, overpaying. We don't want to Weimar Germany here. We have hyperinflation. But the trouble with higher rates is it's, it doesn't stimulate investing anymore. It takes money out of the stock market. Because then they have a better choice to put it in bonds and get a reasonable return. Right now, it, it, this is just my own personal opinion, but I'm sure there's some validity to it. A lot of people are just buying stocks because they can't make any money in bonds. That's exactly what's That's been going on. That's not a good on. reason, necessarily, to throw your money into stocks that are already trading at multiples higher than the balls on a giraffe. Paying too much asset dilation. We see it in real estate. We see it in the stock market. We see it in new cars. If you've looked at a new Chevrolet Tahoe as an example, they want $71,000 for that car. Are you kidding me? That's wage inflation. That's insurance inflation built into there. Our concern right now is what you're talking about. We call it disintermediation when, when U.S. investors are going other places to get yield, high-risk places. Uh, as we'll talk about, the third world country right now is a big concern of ours. The U.S. dollar is getting more and more expensive because all the money's coming to the U.S. because it's the last bastion of safety. And, to keep and as money. the Fed raises interest rates, the dollar will get even more expensive. Yes. Making it harder for us to sell our stuff to the third world or wherever we're selling it. So here's our third concern. We have a currency risk now because the higher the dollar gets, the more, it, the more difficult it becomes from, for third world countries to pay back dollar denominated debt. Simply stated, millions and millions of Americas went to the third world to buy fixed income to get reasonable rates of return in our zero percent interest rate environment. Those bonds are due at the end of next year, and there's no way these, these countries like Turkey and Brazil, I could go down the line, are going to be able to pay those bonds back. So, so gonna... what would happen under that circumstance? Well, we're looking at a massive bond default, you know, not to and mention... And you're pretty sure they're, they're not going to figure their way out of that. I know Italy has trouble with their banking system, too. I mean, Greece had it. I don't know if they've recovered completely. No, they haven't no, even begun. Just the Germans are helping everybody over there. The Germans and formerly the U.S. <laughs> but, but you, you, so what, in, in the nightmare scenario, the unwinding nightmare scenario, Turkey defaults on its bonds, uh, some of these African nations can't pay, uh, Spain can't pay, what would happen? What would be the, the snowball that could really tear the hair off of, uh, a, a, of a beetle? Well, the banking system has what we call veiled non-locality, okay? They're all connected. <laughs> 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 and uh, that's been part of globalism, and that was supposed to be a huge benefit. But it's also a disaster device right now, Deutsche Bank and all the banks that have money that originally loaned money to the third world countries so they could loan money to the U.S. or, or sell bonds. Uh, it's the, it's the, this connectedness today that creates problems. And so that's a real risk. Again, this isn't apocalyptic or anything. It's just, it just pretends a lot of pain out there for people who aren't smart enough to place their money intelligently in the right place so at the right time. at this point now, we should be, according to your theorem, preparing for a time where the last keg has already hit the, 
frat house. <laughs> yes. And people are going to be coming down. <laughs> right. <laughs> the girls have gone home. <laughs> the band stopped playing. There's no more beer. And at that moment, what, Scott, are you advising your clients to do so that they can keep their Red Mountain houses? Well, first of all, leaving the party early is always a great idea so you don't have that horrible hangover the next day. I, I got to tell you, I got a friend who's <laughs> a very, very wealthy guy, he's very smart, uh, and he always says, you see all those jets at Aspen Airport? He said, they were all bought by people who sold out before the top. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we've seen the changing of the guard here. We had oil men in the 70s, and then they were taken out. We've had high-tech people, and they were taken out in the in the, uh, the, the market crash of 2004 in the tech sector. Today, all I see are Wall Street guys. I just, I won't mention names, but I talked to a really prominent guy from New York, big investment banker, and I said, hey, there's too many Wall Street guys up here. This is, you know, this is a, in Aspen, an, you an indicator. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are making too much money. Right. But what, who was it in the 20s? Was it J.P. Morgan or Rockefeller who said, uh, only a fool holds out for the last dollar? Exactly. The idea now, we're about a year ahead of the game. We think we're going to start to see the signs of some kind of a, a market-driven slowdown. The market's going to correct first. The market's going to bring the economy with it this time. There's so many billions now in the market. It's all about sentiment. When people start losing in the market, they stop consuming and buying new cars. Right, it gets on our nerves. You feel like you're going to be less rich. Your wife's not going to be happy. She's not going to go over to Hermes and buy a handbag. I mean, everything sort of... Market sentiment, talk about market sentiment, it's still pretty strong right now. Well, that's the concern right now because most people are seduced by a straight line. It's the most dangerous mindset in investing. There's this big straight line out there of profits with a big juicy dollar sign at the end. And, uh, you know, there's going to be some big interruptions here, we think ahead. Now, here's the advantage. We don't have prescience. We can't see perfectly. So let's say there isn't a recession and this continues. It's still a ridiculously high risk to, place to have your money. But if we take and go into resilient stocks and high quality investments, what's the record? Since 2010, the stocks we're talking about, the high quality companies, have averaged almost 13% compared to 7% for the indexes of like the S&P 500. That's in good markets. In down markets, these blue chip high quality investments, whether they're bonds or stocks or real estate, have averaged about 7% in down markets compared to 2% for the S&P 500. So we have a nice hedge. You can't go wrong. And one thing we didn't mention is how much cash do you want to have on the sidelines? We call it dry powder in this business. And it's a good time to start taking some profits and putting cash uh, on the side. And when you say cash, are you talking about really cash? Because it seems like a lot of times when you pull money out of the stock market, you put it in bonds, but bonds could get crushed also right now. So you don't want to, you're talking about just like, like under the mattress kind of cash, keep it in a, a bank account. Well, at this, exactly. At this point, uh, there's probably a great total return if you've been invested. So you can afford to take a break for a year. I mean, we're getting, you know, one and three quarters to two percent now in passbook uh, savings accounts, money markets. And it's a great place just to park cash. The dollar's increasing in value, so that hasn't been a, been a bad investment. Uh, I'm not recommending gold or Bitcoin at this point. Talk about gold. Gold at one time, you know, 50, 100 years ago was always, a, uh, it was sentiment that you yeah, always have something in gold. But nowadays, the young hedge fund guys and everything, they wouldn't buy gold. If it, Why is it so out of favor? Because it doesn't give you a yield? What's the... Well, gold is, of course, an amazing metal and one of the metals that, of ascendant man, you know, uh, chemically and everything else. But it's always been a drag on a portfolio. That's the species itself. You have a problem of where you're going to keep it. Where do you find a market? What denomination do you buy it in? You know, have you ever noticed these apocalyptic scenarios never come due? We have a lot of survivalists that are hoarding gold. Right. They got bottled water and guns and gold. They sell, it sells guns and gold and bottled water. But they never seem, and they sell books. That's the main thing. But uh, we, you know, we like buying gold on a leveraged basis through great gold mining companies. A lot of the managers that uh, I work with and I'm associated with, we buy gold mining stocks, and we've done well on that. But right now, we're keeping 25 to 50 percent cash, and then a good balance of resilient global stocks. 25 to 50 percent cash. That's a huge percentage compared to the historical 10% or something. It is. 
Uh, but, you know, we're at a historical level right now in a bull market. Uh, we're at a market that's been juiced. We're at a market that, uh, by any measure, is get, beginning to get overvalued. And look, the first thing you learn when you get a, a, a job on Wall Street is the five most dangerous words. And those are, things are different this, this time. Yeah, that was John Templeton, I think, who said that. And yeah, I, this time it's different. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. We'll start to, yeah, exactly. And uh, when your shoeshine boy starts giving you advice on stocks, I'm starting to hear that. Yeah. And we're seeing, we're not hearing about this speculative binge that's going on now because the, the media megaphone isn't really advertising it like they used to. Uh, they're talking about Mueller, which, by the way, I think we have to be careful with that situation. That's one of the risks right now with inflation and higher rates and currency wars and tariffs. Political risk. Political risk. And Trump is like teetering right now on uh, Michael Cohn's uh, stumbles because uh, I just saw in the news this morning that Michael Cohn has pleaded guilty to a potpourri of crimes and apparently uh, they're speculating that he's going to throw the president under the bus so if he hasn't a... already done so. And But how, it's interesting, you'd think the markets would like sell off a thousand points on that and they're just going along and they're a little confident. Well, that's a great point, Jerry. Um, you, you look at this situation, we went back and took a look at Watergate, for example, and it took it a couple of years to actually discount the market. The thing to remember about politics is politics causes volatility. Markets are driven by earnings. We're expecting 21% growth in earnings this year, which, you know, the party's juiced, right? Right, the party is juiced, and, and at the end of the day, the earnings the companies throw off are going to define the height of the S&P 500. That's basically unless those earnings are jeopardized by something. Well put. So what we're looking at is 10% growth in earnings next year, a big slowdown as people begin to feel squeezed. And people are beginning to feel squeezed now, especially with inflation in the food sector. We don't feel that that much up here in Aspen. But if you go and you travel, which I do all the time, I have foundation accounts all over the country, and I go, and, and this prosperity is not equal. I mean, I go to California, and there are people living under viaducts. I go to Minnesota, and there's poverty on the streets, people living on the streets like I've never seen before. I mean, something's up, isn't it, Mr. Jones? Remember that line from Bob Dylan's song? Yeah. But uh, most people aren't aware of it. Uh, the, the upper middle class is gone. We have a middle class and a lower middle class. We have a problem with distribution of wealth, which is becoming incendiary. Well, I mean, we do have, uh, unfortunately... The thing that defined America as the greatest country in the world was the strength of our middle class. Yes. And we're losing that. We're polarizing now. The rich get richer. Aspen, Colorado. I mean, you walk into a restaurant, you can't get a seat for $40 uh, tacos or whatever. And you go somewhere else and people don't have, you know, the ability to pay their electric bill. So that disparity, income disparity, is growing bigger and that's not a healthy thing at the end of the day. Well, you study history, and if the chest pains of democracy <laughs> are when you start hearing the word socialism and the incendiary talk of revolution, we're seeing revolution in this country right now. I mean, you know, with the, everyone has a screen, and, and they can see, you know, uh, I wonder what the poor people are doing today attitude. Why not let them eat cake in that 1%? Yeah. And something... You know, that, that becomes a real but problem. ironically, and I always make this point, even in the last election cycle, if my joke is that Bernie Sanders learned a valuable lesson about socialism because the Democrats took the votes he earned and gave them to Hillary. Yes. <laughs> but Bernie Sanders could have won that election if they just would have let it have its normal organic end rather than trying to pick a candidate. The, he, his message, his socialist, egalitarian message resonates with a lot of the country that isn't doing well. Well, it's, it's a messianic appeal to a leader. Uh, we, we had it to a certain extent with Obama. We have it with a populist trend now with, with Trump, where there's a sense that one man can completely change the system and make a difference. And it's a lie. Uh, I'm hoping that in the next election that the Democrats are able to move a little bit to center like that, they did during the Kennedy administration. And like Clinton did in his second term because he yes. knew that's why he was successful in his second term. It's like we're really 
there's an old aphorism that Americans like. They pick their politicians from the left and the right, but they like them to govern from the center. Yes. This kind of like uh, Dwight Eisenhower kind of, you know, prosperity and not doing too much to screw things up. I think that's true. Okay, so what's the worst mistake right now? Okay, a guy's got some money in his in his Fidelity account or wherever. It doesn't. Maybe he can't afford a, an investment advisor like you. Maybe he can. Maybe he should call you. But what's the worst mistake that the average investor who doesn't have professional advice is going to make tomorrow? First of all, to, to get full exposure in the market in high-tech stocks or any sectors that are overvalued, they're going to be great long-term, but in the short term, there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. Right now, if you've got cash, it's probably a great time to sit on that cash. Uh, we may have a year-end rally. But sit on, the, sit on this market and see where rates are at at the end of the year. If we have an inverted yield curve, then remain to be patient. Stay in savings accounts, stay in money market accounts, stay in utility companies, conservative ambassador stocks like we talked about, limited to intermediate bonds. That means bonds that have average maturities of three, five, seven, maybe 10 years at the most. High quality. You wouldn't go out in long-term bonds right now because mm -hmm. if we get inflation, those are going to be crushed like a bug. They're going to be crushed. The good news, though. Although what's interesting is I've been short the long bond personally, and a lot of smart money has been short the long bond, and we've been dead wrong. We've been suffering. As much as we know interest rates at some point have to go up, they haven't. <laughs> well, we think there's going to be a process of rate increases now. Look, here's the Fed's dilemma. They know we're going to have a recession. They don't know exactly when. They're like we are. They just know all the indicators are in place. And they need to get interest rates to a, a rate to a point where they can exercise monetary policy, not Keynesian policy, policies of printing like we have the last 16 years. But they want to get rates to the point where they can lower rates again to stimulate the economy. And we aren't at a, at a, 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 side line, at a, at a level right now where they can do that and make a meaningful attempt. So their only choice now, if we had a recession, is to print more money, quantitative easing, That's open market operations. That's what we had under under the last couple of Fed chairmen, but you can't just keep doing that forever. No. And remember, the investments that we're in, supposed to be in now, I noticed utility, utility stocks, for example, are at the bottom of the list in terms they're of They're at the bottom because they're... We need to be contrarians, and we may yeah. lose a little bit of money in these high-quality positions. Uh, you don't worry about that with bonds because you have a maturity. You get your money back at a given time if you have high-quality bonds. And you just sit for the next year in these contrary positions, and pretty soon we're going to have what they call a flight to quality, where the, all the speculators and everybody else are going to move into bonds and high-quality stocks, and we're going to already be there, and that's where we make our money. It's a pretty simple equation. Talk about, Scott, talk about how quickly things can go sour. And people say, well, I'll have plenty of time to talk about how quickly the sentiment can turn, that you get these massive sell-offs in the market, and then people say, well, I'll just wait for it to come back, and they knock it down again, and the shorts jump on it. Talk about the fact that it may be better to give up the last 5 or 10% of the upside so you don't get smacked in the head. We call it leaving something on the table. Bulls make money. Bears make money. Greedy people go broke. Joan Didion, the great author from the 60s, the narrative muse that had so many great books, she said everything can change in the moment. And it's true, especially in this accelerated high-tech economy we're in. Anything can change. Uh, it could be a conflict. We can't begin to predict what we like to call it freeze, what the freeze accident could be. We just know we have an aged bull market that's very vulnerable to surprises, uh, insults. Uh, these have included, once again, interest rates, inflation, currency wars, tariffs, political upheaval. Uh, we're on a high-risk bridge right now crossing the river. What about foreign uh, company, uh, countries like a, a lot of the uh, undeveloped markets, China is coming on. Uh, are, are you promoting investment in those, India? You know, we're, we're concerned right now because China has such a, a vast overlay of debt. They've completely overbuilt. And because of the form of governance that they have, uh, they're going to recover from that. But it could take many years, just like we're seeing right now in Japan. It's taken, they had that huge expanse and yeah, they overbuilt. Back in the late 80s. They, and bought, they bought assets at their dilated prices. I remember Marvin Davis when he owned Aspen Ski Company. 
and he sold Pebble Beach to the Japanese. At and a we massive... thought the Japanese were going to own everything. At the, the Japanese were putting gold on their sushi, remember? Yeah, I mean... it, it was just uh, uh, an orgy of speculation. And Marvin Davis ended up buying Pebble Beach back at half the price he sold it to the Japanese at that yeah. point. And I think we're going to see that again. Uh, there's a book called The 100 Mile Marathon on China. I think everybody should read it. Uh, they're diabolical. They deal in deception. Look strong when you're weak. Read the book. It talks about their economic goals. They're targeting 2045, but they want nothing short than complete and total economic control of the world. Uh, you know, it's an interesting scenario. But Chinese have always been a lot more patient than us. They think in like a thousand year periods. They're not in a hurry. You know, America, we have time, you know, half time in the game. We got to get back and we, we're not very patient. Well, we aren't, and you know, there's a, there's there's converging trends that are dangerous to democracy and freedom. And of course, the whole history of democracy has been, you know, democracy, tyranny, democracy, tyranny. That's the entire history. Whether you go back to, to Athens or wherever you want to look, at this point, and uh, we have also have it's called gradualism. I mean, the the socialists, the Fabian socialism, has been a gradual uh, trend. It's and it's growing all over the world. The millennials really don't look negatively at socialism. They don't understand it. They don't understand it, except they don't see what's happening in Venezuela with Maduro and the fact that they have shortages of everything and no medication. They just think the idea is good. That's why even ideas like communism, communism is a great idea. It just, unfortunately, the laws of human nature haven't been repealed, and it doesn't work. It doesn't promote excellence. Uh, it doesn't distribute goods and services efficiently. It's a nightmare. It, but it, it is a work. good idea. It is a good idea. It sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. So, okay, diversification, uh, is that like a general principle that we need to worry about? Or can, can you, should you put all your eggs in one basket? That's a, a great question I think that every investor needs to ask themselves. And the question these days is how do you invest in a world of populism? You know, we have these populist presidents like Macron and Trump and uh, Merkel and Obradosa in Mexico, who we won't really know what he's going to do policy-wise until December when he starts serving. But you want, America doesn't have a monopoly on resilient companies with enduring competitive advantages. So in an uh, intelligent tradition of diversification, you want to have holdings all over the world or globally. We tend to have a value orientation. That's just coming back into vogue now. It's been out of out of pop out but of style. Most of the value is still in the U.S. right now, though, huh? It it is. Although you know, Europe's selling at a discount right now. They have very low sentiment there. Uh, they've had production problems because of the winter that they had. Where there. are the best places in Europe? Is it still Germany, or where else would you look? You know, the, these resilient companies exist just about everywhere. You know, there aren't going to be a lot of them. America has the, the largest number right now because we're the most solid place, safe place in the world to, to park money, if you will. Are you concerned about Brexit? No one really knows what's going to happen with the UK once, the, uh, once they leave the EU. Uh, what are we thinking about that? Well, once again, you know, it's, it's an issue of the efficient uh, distribution of goods and services. That's why Brexit is be even being considered in the first place. Look, central control doesn't work. We're in a network world right now. We're in the third wave. We've gone from an industrial age economy to an information age economy, and these gaps are replete with, with uh, uncertainty. Everything's changing, and central control is no longer the trend in the future. It's network control where a lot of the... Uh, information and power is distributed to the periphery in the hands of many people and it's difficult to say today who's in charge but central control is inefficient it doesn't work it doesn't work in the US it doesn't work in China because they're always off on their timing or their predictions or their models just it's better to let the market determine what should happen free market free market but you know it's interesting I'm a big free market person but our markets, even in America, aren't free. They're highly controlled. Right. Aspen Real Estate's a perfect example. We won't let you build one extra square foot on your house. You know, we'll chop your legs off with, with a chainsaw if you try to build an extra square foot. So it's not a free market here. But that sort of does control the, the rarity value and the pricing. It does, but it's only benefiting a sliver of the society again. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, we live in a very insular world here, right? And on a percentage basis, the people who live here represent maybe 1% of the population. 
But they have one percent probably has sixty or seventy percent of the wealth of America concentrated in places like Aspen, Malibu, Southampton, St. Bart's. It's the same five hundred people, by the way. Montecito, California, <laughs> Montecito. Where, I, where I live part time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're not. They're not. You know, exactly in touch with reality. No, I always say about Aspen, Scott. We're two square miles surrounded by reality. Right. Because right. you walk around and everybody's going to Matsuhisa and it's like there's a whole place out there called the United States of America where people don't drink champagne. They drink beer, okay? They go to church, they go to the school, fried chicken uh, thing. It's very wholesome. They, uh, they like guns. It's just like we're in a place it's like not anything like real life. And this is the problem. I mean, how serious is this going to get? It becomes revolutionary and incendiary well, at some that's point. That's interesting. I say we're here because real life is grossly overrated. I mean, yeah. who, who wants that real life? Right. I mean, it's right. brutal. And yet, I know, when, uh, I know how compassionate you are, and we consider other people. We don't have let them eat, the let them eat cake. No, 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 no. We want the country to do well. That's the thing. It's like when I grew up in very modest circumstances, I wanted that middle class dream to be able to succeed. And I want it for the next guy. Yes. I want it for the people who are landscapers. I want them to start a landscaping company. I want them to do well because mm -hmm. that's what America is about. So w talk a little bit about the, the investment advisory business as a business. Highly competitive, mm -hmm. and yet you've been successful in it for many years, why do you think? What? Well, you know, we started, I started out, uh, I'm, I'm conservative. And uh, I- So you don't lose people's money. That's the name of the game, you don't lose money. I, I, I could have built my business on speculation, but you're only as good as your last trade. It's like living a night of one night stands. Right. There's a mentality <laughs> out there where, where people want, they want more excitement than they do profit. And I don't want to get into, uh, you know, a gambling addiction. That's that's what they face. So I chose right away to deal with conservative people with, you know, reasonable amounts of money, uh, who wanted more money, and we hedged in the downturn. We don't worry about necessarily equaling the indexes all the time. We want to protect on the downside because so many of my clients are people who've worked extremely hard. Uh, they're self-made for the most part, and they took many chances to get there, and they want to preserve their principle now. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, what did Renoir say to Van Gogh? Show me the Monet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been a I wonderful like guest. If people want to reach you, Scott, is there a website or do you have a? Uh, NTB Financial. NTB Financial. That's uh, November Tango Bravo Financial. In Denver. Okay. Uh, uh, that's the best way to reach me. Very and, good. And uh, it's great to finally get on the show. Thank you for good. the opportunity. Oh, you've been an excellent guest as you've, Extremely articulate and well versed in your uh, discipline. And uh, if you see Scott in town, go over and say hello. He's a very, very nice guy, Thank in you. addition to being a guru investor. And we will see you next week. Thanks, Jerry.